Okay, awesome. So, um, thank you so much for coming and being here. There's a number of important things we want to talk about and more importantly do. Uh, just as a very quick recap, um, our approach to sustainability is try arguing for anything else. Um, how could you possibly argue to do something that's unsustainable? Uh, if, you, if something can't go on forever, then it won't. Uh, so if it's not going to go on forever, if it's unsustainable, it's either going to break or it's going to break us, or we get there first and we do something about it and make sure it is sustainable. Uh, so that's, that's sustainable Wellesley's approach. And also our mission is to encourage the residents, businesses and town of Wellesley to take the actions required for sustainability. So everything's about what can we do about that? How do we make it better? Uh, so the education is about how we do it better. The interfacing with the town and everything else is you know, the so what. And uh, I just want to start off with a few so what's from elsewhere in the state. This comes directly from a Sierra Club email. And it was just so much good news. Uh, I won't read through all of them. Uh, but I find this very encouraging and very heartening uh, because sometimes it feels like we're in this on our own. Uh, maybe nobody's listening. Uh, and also, I think we don't, we don't look back enough or give ourselves credit enough. You know, plastic bag ban, um, you know, just for example, uh, we do get stuff done. And there are other people all across the state getting stuff done. And you know, most of what we're looking at, we don't have to start from scratch. Um, we'll be hearing about gas leaks more. You know, we've already done a lot on that. Um, so, uh, I'll take that off. Um, just a few things before we get into the um, body of the meeting. And one of them is, just want to ask your help about where we meet. Um, this and all thanks to Laurel, who's standing at the back, it is just a fabulous place to meet. Thank you so much. Um, really has been very generous and um, such a lovely space. Um, the only difficulty, or, you know, a difficulty, the difficulty is it's not accessible. It's not ADA accessible. The only way here is upstairs. Uh, so. If anybody has any ideas about where else we might meet uh, that would be more inclusive, um, give that a thought. Yeah. Well, you've probably thought of it, but the Department of Aging, the new building, is that so hard to... Is that the Tolls Carson Center? Yeah, or? right. Okay. It, it's not really, they, it's not really open for, oh, okay. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But the community center has a name. It does. Yes, it does. It does. Yes. It's, it doesn't go up the stairs like we do. It just goes to the side and it comes in the door. Okay. <coughs> okay. Great. And if you think of any others, um, let us know. A uh, couple of announcements. One <coughs> is that milkweed is coming back. Uh, so every year we sell hundreds of milkweed plants. Um, Laurel again manages all of that. Um, are you a master? Are you a master gardener? You're, are you a master gardener? Uh, I did the master gardener program at uh, at I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Master gardener program. <laughs> <laughs> so as our as our resident expert, um, we get uh, large numbers. Uh, we're getting the most we've ever got this year. Uh, of native milkweed species, uh, which is the only plant that the monarch butterfly uh, can lay eggs on. Uh, so you plant it in your garden, and you get it from us at a very modest fee, um, and you will see monarchs. I think everybody that's planted, I certainly do, um, you'll see monarchs uh, in your garden, which is great. When are they for sale? Where? Uh, they'll be arriving end of May. Jubilation too, and we, it's a teeny tiny fundraiser for us on the top of it all. 
Yeah. Basically, you order them off of the website and then you come and pick them up on my porch. <laughs> Yeah. They take full sun. They yes. Have, they yes. Sun. Yeah. Can they make it in shade or person? I'm going to say no because I keep buying them and it doesn't work. That's oh. what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Has not seen monarchs. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what's happened to me, but I haven't really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've got mine in several different places. I've got mine with some of them have late shade and they work. Uh, but yeah, I think otherwise as sunny as possible. Um, okay, and then the MLP, uh, our municipal light plant, has a new incentive for electric car owners. And if you promise to um, plug in your car and charge overnight, they will give you $8 off each month on your electricity bill. Wow. Um, wow. So you take a little photograph, as I understand it, of your timer just once and send it and say, look, I've set it to charge at night. Um, so yet another reason uh, to drive without fossil fuel emissions. Uh, because it's worth it to the town. Um, there's, we pay a fixed rate for electricity. What goes on the other side gets really complicated and their prices change dramatically according to <coughs> how many people are on and what the peak load is uh, and what capacity has to be available all year just in case we have a really sunny um, day in July. <coughs> and if you can take load off during the day uh, where it's high and put it on at night, uh, it can save the town money. So um, I think that was it for announcements. Um, we are going to talk about several things today, two of which I remember. I know there's another one. Uh, one is gas leaks, one is transportation, um, and I'll be up again to talk about that. And the third one was... Um, waste reduction and the parade, and pesticides. Parade. I got it. Okay, she's got it. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll do a little bit on each of those. Um, probably most on transportation because I've got some survey data that I've done and Josh Joe, yeah. Joe, sorry, um, uh, from the high school uh, has a presentation to make as well, uh, but we're going to start off with gas leaks, and then after all of that, the talking, um, we get more into the bit I started with, which is the action, so having heard all of that, which bit do you most identify with, which bit can you help out with, uh, which bit do you want to make a difference with? Okay, thank you. Lisa's going to talk about gas leaks. So um, I'm Lisa Olney, and I'm now on the Wellesley Board of Selectmen. I was previously on the Natural Resources Commission, where we um, started working on gas leaks two, three years ago. Um, and the NRC's interest was really in how it was affecting our public shade trees. Uh, it, it kills shade trees. So we have over 200 leaks in Wellesley that we know of. Um, and we commissioned a study at the NRC in 2017, I think which showed that the, actually the methane was even more widespread than we had previously thought. Um, and lots of other towns are grappling with the <coughs> same problem. So just to give you an idea of the scale as background, um, Massachusetts Utilities reported 27,731 gas leaks mm -hmm. in 2017. Um, and they do repair, they work on repairing them over the course of the year. So at the year's end, there were still 15,829. And as they repair them, more show up. So this is just an ongoing problem that results from having really old gas pipes, cast iron pipes, all throughout our state. Um, so a number of towns have gotten together to look at how we can handle this problem from the standpoint of the municipalities. And uh, about a year ago, a group formed sort of an informal group of about 21 towns with people from um, national grid territory. Uh, national Grid has been among the slowest of the three major gas companies in Massachusetts to respond to this problem. And so a lot of these towns were experiencing the same frustrations that Wellesley has been without w not seeing much progress. So we organized this group to um, approach National Grid to talk about how we might improve coordination on fixing the leaks. Um, National Grid so far has refused to meet with the group. We made a formal request <coughs> to, to National Grid in January um, and repeated approaches to them have resulted in um, them declining to meet with us. 
So we're still working at it. Um, we, we don't, um, we, you know, we see that this is really the avenue where we can be most productive is to try and approach them with some realistic kind of practical suggestions for improving coordination. Um, and we, we're not really understanding their reluctance. So we're still at it. Um, and in the meantime, other work that's being done on gas leaks, um, there are new regulations that require the gas companies to do more in the way of repair. Um, National Grid, unfortunately, hasn't committed to uh, the particular, they have an option as to what method they can use to identify gas leaks. And National Grid is the only one of the three that isn't so far committing to using the leak extent method, which is the most effective way of identifying the really big leaks. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're sort of repeatedly coming up against this theme of um, challenging relationship with, uh, with National Grid that we're trying to work on. And in the meantime, there's a, a piece of legislation that our own state senator, Cynthia Cream, has sponsored called the Future Act. Um, which would start looking at what we n might want to do overall. So this, this whole problem of gas leaks across the state, is, it's estimated to cost $9 billion um, to repair all of this pipe, because basically what we have to do is rip out all the cast iron pipe and put in plastic PVC pipe, which only has a lifespan of about 60 years. Um, so 60? 60. So the question is, you know, do we want to keep committing to this same infrastructure that's based on fossil fuel use um, over the long haul? And do we want to spend $9 billion, and that's a conservative estimate, to just sort of get more of the same? And so what the Future Act would do, among the things it would do, is allow gas companies to start exploring other ways of using that infrastructure to convey hot water, for example. Um, because we really need to start looking at how to use other forms of energy for our thermal use, not just, you know, we talk a lot about needing renewables for electricity, but we don't talk so much about what alternatives we might have for heating our houses. So this bill would open up the possibility for the gas companies, which they're not by, by statute allowed to actually um, explore alternatives. So this would allow them that possibility of Look, there are all kinds of options for, for how they might rethink this, the infrastructure. I won't go into that, but if anyone wants to talk about it, I'm really excited to do so. I also want to mention that Alice Peich has signed on to the Future Act on the House side, and uh, of State Senator Becca Roush, who's got the three precincts on the far side of Wellesley, has also. Um, so we can really be grateful to our own legislators, and there's a lot of work being done now to build support for this in the House in particular. So that's my update, and I'd be happy to answer any questions for folks afterward. Oh, sure. Yeah. Jonah, are you ready to do yeah. your part? I'll or I can do that now. I can do that um, in the middle of the transportation. Um, okay, I was so. Okay, I'll start off the um, transportation piece um, with what I did, and then if you want to follow that, that's great. Yeah, and Alan, I, I would like to go after Alan too. <laughs> okay. I'm more of a side note. <laughs> Never. Never. Um, so just get that going. Um, I am doing a greenhouse gas inventory of Wellesley High School. Um, so it's part of a project, part of a course that I'm doing. And one reason why I chose the high school is because it's really easy, because it's new, and there's not much you can do to improve it. Um, so that gave me lots of spare time to focus on something that I think we can do something about, and that's transportation. Um, in fact, a couple of things, but one of them is transportation. Uh, so what I did was I did a survey of all of uh, Wellesley High School students. Um, so it went out to all 1,504, uh, got 375 um, replies, so 20-something uh, percent, which I'm quite happy with. Um, we might get some more if we send out a reminder. Um, but I think we're going to be, I think we can take this as, um, at least directionally helpful. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I went out less than a week ago. Um, so, what, uh, I asked people what grade they're in, how long they've been in town, um, how far they are from school, how they get to school, how they get home from school, uh, what vehicle they're in so I can work out the emissions, uh, whether they're sharing a ride, um, whether they're being driven or um, driving themselves, and also asked, you know, why if you don't walk or take the bus or ride a bike or share a car, why not? Um, so this is, I, I can talk through it, this is the share by distance of the behavior. So this is a quarter of a mile, so I asked, you know, are you zero to half a mile away, half a mile to one mile away? Um, so the distance from school goes up to here, and here we're at 30 miles. And then, how do you get there? Green is walking. So no surprise, walkers live close. Uh, yellow, conveniently, is school bus. Uh, so that's the proportion that come by school bus. Red is driven by somebody else, and orange is drive themselves. So the red colours are cars, bus, walking with a little bit of riding, um, and one person that takes the public bus. Uh, one observation is from here on, so more than half a mile away, a car is used for um, at least half of uh, all of the trips to school. So that's the share, but then not everybody, we don't have equal numbers of people living at all of those distances. Uh, so this is counting the number of trips. Uh, so most people are at the one to two and a half miles or two and a half to four miles distance. Um, and and uh, we've got a fair amount of bus there, but then drive myself and, and driven. If you've got any questions asked, my plan is just to kind of skip through it to give you um, a little color. Yeah. Just to be clear to people, the, the 7.5 to 30 is likely on um, students who are participating in the MEDCO program, so yes. they live in Boston. Yes, yes. So can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So on that first slide, did that vary seasonally? Like, did, did you ask them? No. no. No, but a really good point. Um, you know, it was last Tuesday, and I said, what's your typical way to school? And if you don't have a typical way, answer for today. So it's a, it's a stab. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, I'm sure it changes by, by season. Um, which is one... 70% of the kids at the high school participate in athletics. So if you have a hockey bag one season, you're a cross yeah. stuff, I'm sure yeah. it does. Alter. Yeah. Yeah, important. Was that, sorry, just to school? No, this is, um, oh sorry, this is to school and it's very similar from okay. um, it gets it starts getting really complicated for that reason. Yeah, no, I know. That's People don't saying. go home, right. and I did ask, you know, so do you go home? And if you don't, where do you go? And how do you get there? And the data starts getting, um, yeah. Uh, but good point. Um, so uh, that's the numbers of trips, and then if we look at the emissions, is this too small? We can make that bigger. Um, but the, the point is, you know, the emissions from a school bus, even though it's quite a lot of trips, is pretty small because you've got a lot of people in a bus. It only does seven miles per gallon and uses diesel, uh, but it's taking a lot of people. Um, the drive myself in orange, and then the driven uh, is obviously the uh, preponderance. And then one question that was very relevant to me, and I think is very relevant anyway, is, you know, so what? Does that really matter? Uh, we look at the traffic, we look at the cars, and we think, gosh, all those SUVs, they're sitting there, and they're idling, and, you know, there's pollution and emissions, and uh, is it really a lot? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is yes, it is. Um, it compares with, uh, it's about the same amount of emissions as the school gets from all of its use of natural gas for a whole year. So this is multiplied out for a year. 
So if you could take out all of the heating and cooking from the school, you'd have the same impact as if you took out all of the student commuting. And, and that doesn't count the, all the congestion of all the other cars yes. caused by the school congestion. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, this is looking at emissions, <coughs> but not looking at ozone and particulates and other things that have health impacts. Um, and then also, um, so that was this one in comparison with the heating and cooking emissions. Uh, and it's two thirds of the amount um, of emissions that comes from the electricity used um, at the high school. What, if anything, does the school administration do with students about transportation related issues? First of all, do they do anything? I don't know. Uh, I can answer that one. <laughs> we might get a response yes, when, when Jonah stands up. Um, sorry, is there a question? The, and then, so the last thing was I asked people, so why not? And I prompted them with some of these, and then they added some of their own. Uh, so across all of bus and ride and car share, uh, why don't I do that? Um, or why would I, what would make me do it? Well, if I lived closer. And that's kind of, I would walk if I lived closer. Look at this, though. Second most, if I knew of another student with the same schedule, then I could share a ride. I mean, internet. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's, and what's Drive the company by. called? Um, I contacted, there's Miles to Share. Yeah. Miles to Share is a startup that does this for schools. Uh, if we could park more easily, we as you know, a driver and another student could park more easily. Uh, if the weather was better, I gave them that one. Wait, I mean, so can I just clarify? So if we could park more easily, in other words, if, if we could park more easily, we'd be more likely to carpool? Yes. That was so, yes, yes. Um, I you know, if, or if there was, a, again, if there was a, if there was a favor given right. to incentive. car sharing incentive. Yeah. So we have, um, and Jenna, I don't want to steal your thunder, but 230, 250 plus students driving every day. Uh, there are 100 parking spots. I got all of this from Jenna. In the, in the parking lot for students, it cost a lot of money to the student, um, and 20 of them are for car sharers. So mm -hmm. how, how about making them all mm -hmm. for car sharers? Mm -hmm. um, more bus times available in the morning. Uh, if it, the bus is less expensive, if I felt comfortable driving with another um, student, bus times in the afternoon, places in the afternoon, more comfortable on the bus if I felt safe. Hold on a second, Quinn. Yeah. What, why are they not comfortable on the bus? Do we know? I, I haven't got that far. Okay. Um, I didn't know if that was a relevant question yet. Well, you have 44 yeah. people yeah. applying for some yeah. reason they're not comfortable on the yeah. bus. Yeah. This is not my term, but in years past it's been referred to as the loser cruiser. <laughs> it has a bad reputation. So it's kind of nice. I don't know. Um, yeah, my kids never took the bus, but that was. We got a lot of, you know, we're down to three, but I left this one on, you know, for purpose. I would never. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of, I wouldn't take the bus, nothing would make me take the bus. Um, you, just different versions of the same thing. So there's some resistance. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a small proportion, and if we don't get them, we don't get them. Uh, but the, the, I think, you know, if I felt more comfortable, that's, so a, that's a significant population. It's a social. Yes. Social. Yes. And safe leaving my bike at school. Is bike theft at school a big problem? I don't know. There's but a perception at least. Yeah. Or at least, yeah, there's, that's holding some people back. And somebody said, if I could park my bike under a, an awning, and you know the bikes are out there in the rain. So you arrive in the rain. You're getting off in the rain. You come back afterwards. You've got a wet seat. You've got a wet bike. Um, you know, there's not a lot of encouragement there. Um, so I didn't want to, we can dive into it. We're going to go into a transportation breakout. I don't want to spend too long, um, but give you a, uh, a flavor of what I found out. Ellen. Do you want me to give a little context of what you're doing? Yeah, great. I just want to say that's fantastic. Yes, that's yeah. a lot of work and incredible yeah. important. Oh, so thank you.
Yeah. This is totally amazing. So just backing up for some context. And Who this are you? Oh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I'm uh, Ellen Corby. I've been on the Sustainable Energy Committee for the last uh, nine years. I've just been elected to the Board of Public Works, which puts me also on the board of the uh, MLP. And I, um, so on the Sustainable Energy Committee, the, the, the big elephant in the room has been transportation because we've, emissions were being reduced in other places and in transportation they weren't and it's 43% of the carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. it was one of, for a whole bunch of reasons, it's something we just never dealt with. And finally, about a year ago, we said, wow, we, <laughs> we have to address this. And by default, I ended up being the one coordinating that. Um, and it was a little daunting because transportation is such a big subject. And also, most of it's not in our, our uh, power, I mean, commuter rail, uh, public buses, um, emission requirements on, on uh, vehicles, none of that is under our control. So it was like, okay, what do we do here? So one of the uh, 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 things we started researching was school transportation. And we uh, tried to engage a conversation. Now remember, we are not grassroots, we are the town. So we very quietly, um, it's our job, uh, to uh, work, work the inside, and so on the inside, we were talking to sc the schools, and we were given every reason, like, oh, well, we're very busy, we don't have time, you know, give us a note up about that. And then one of the people in our working group discovered a benchmarking study in which we found out that uh, we have 25% of our students uh, ride the bus, 35% in, uh, in Needham, and 53% in Lexington, and Lexington is a very comparable town to ours. So that started giving us a little bit of uh, traction. And so um, I would say what gave us our final push over the threshold was the students uh, raising their hand to uh, um, voice some very valid uh, concerns where their needs are not being met and at simultaneously um, Quentin raising his hand with this, these results here are going to give us a big giant step in this conversation. So where we are on school transportation after over a year is that the assistant superintendent who uh, is in charge of that, who ran the tr school transportation program in Weston, so she knows that issue very well is actually, um, and it's not official, but we're told will be the school's representative on the uh, Sustainable Energy Committee. And uh, she is now telling us that in beginning of June, as soon as she gets some of uh, the labor negotiations behind her, uh, she is now going to start focusing on this issue. So. I think, I mean, some solutions were screaming out of your, <laughs> your <laughs> survey. Uh, so I think that this is going to, um, so we've got it teed up for someone who's ready to listen, who's the person in the school administration that actually can do something about this. So, um, so I just want to talk really quickly about some of the other entry points that we found and we're beginning to make some progress, but I'll, I'll go real, real quick. So besides um, what I've talked about on, on the schools, um, the Green Schools has been doing some really super work and now with the Girl Scouts on anti-idling and um, safe routes to schools which encourages other forms of transportation other than vehicles is working with Fisk School and we're trying to again plug that in uh, 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 more broadly among the schools. We've also had the uh, members of the school committee met with the Safe Routes to School people to find out how to incorporate, when they do the redistricting, how to incorporate Safe Routes to Schools, uh, alternate ways of getting to school into the redistricting process, which was done in Newton and which is done in, in Lexington. Uh, we've now formed a bicycle working group and Ellen Gibbs is going to uh, uh, chair that and uh, I know Scott Bender's on it. I, I don't know if anyone else here has signed up for that. Uh, the town has signed up for a state program called Complete Streets, 
which means that whenever we are reconstructing a street, we take into account not just what's good for vehicles, but what's good for everybody. And we try to encourage multi safe multimodal transportation issues. Uh, we just got a briefing on sidewalks at the DPW. We've looked at the sidewalk map and they are um, developing a sidewalk policy and a, uh, um, ultimately a sidewalk master plan. Uh, we have to make sure that ties into what's going on with the rest <laughs> with the rest of the town. Always a challenge in, in Wellesley. Um, on ride sharing, there's a great app that we could get for free for the town for all the employees. And uh, we uh, Mary is um, researching that and also what apps are available for ride sharing. Possibly we could do uh, some kind of broader um, uh, in, uh, initiative to encourage uh, uh, ride sharing for uh, commuting and I love the idea. I, I, I think what blew me away the most there was number two about the issue of willingness to share rides. Mm -hmm. um, breaking down segmentation is a big piece of how we can resolve some of these things and this is an example in Lexington um, where 53% already of the students are riding the school buses, the, they have something called Lex Express, which is their uh, public bus. 50% of the riders on that bus are students. So think about this. If you got out of school and there was a public bus going up and down Washington Street, going to Lynx, going to the Warren Building, uh, maybe after Lynx going to 900 Worcester, we we're going to have uh, real traffic problems. Um, if, if that could be an alternative to a school bus. And so um, to that end, we have started conversations with the uh, Metro West, um, uh, MWRT, Metro West Regional Transit Authority, who runs two buses. Right now they run a bus right down Route 9 some, during rush hour every 20 minutes. Start, goes from the Natick Mall to Woodland MBTA and it never stops in Wellesley. Mm -hmm. So um, we're trying to uh, encourage a, um, uh, at least a pilot to stop at Kingsbury. And if you go by at Kingsbury, you'll notice that there are signs saying there's a bus stop there. Guess what? They didn't even know those signs were there and there's not a bus stop there. So um, that's... It there was 40 years ago. Right. <laughs> there was. <laughs> there used to be. Uh, Council on Aging, we identified a bunch of transportation opportunities for them to improve. They have one to three people sitting on a bus that gets like eight miles to the gallon. Um, and certainly not emissions or financially the, most, uh, the best way to do it. And so their management is dealing with that. On electric cars, you talked about this app that is going to be announced uh, shortly by the MLP. Um, and wrapping around it, we're, we're going to have a program to uh, uh, encourage people to purchase electric vehicles. And because our rates are so low, the break-even in, in Wellesley is hundreds and hundreds of dollars better than if you uh, lived in Needham. And um, that's it. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and so we actually are beginning beginning to get a little bit of traction on the issue. Wow. Well, so, okay. Jonah can probably speak to this. Another thing that adds to the complexity is the different start times at the high school. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, the, you know, they, that, they did add that early or late bus. So normally the bus would do the 7.30 pickup before the 7.30 start time, but then there's a 8.30 and a 9.30 start time, so the kids don't want to take bus if they have a 930, yeah. but then they added the 830 bus and that was wildly popular. So, you know, to one of the, you know, solution of the ride sharing, that's something that could be addressed by that, the kids going in the, the 830 the same time. In, in the same way. Right. Yeah. The really high figures that Ellen quoted about Lexington, that was the end of a five year program. And there was just all of these little bits and pieces right. that they did. And it's just chipping away at getting the times right and getting, right. There's yeah. no silver yeah. bullet. No. Exactly. No, it's, but it it's can a be whole done. bunch of things. And, but one thing I forgot to say is that the unified plan said that um, we should have a mobility committee. Lexington has a transportation committee. 
and uh, because this is it's urban planning we're talking about uh, putting in uh, housing at um, uh, Wellesley Office Park. Uh, we're talking, we have uh, kids on Barton Road who get a scholarship to camp and then don't have transportation to get there. Um, I mean, it's, 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 so, it's, it's a social issue, it's an urban planning issue, it's not just an emissions issue. The problem has been that the town just hasn't made that happen. So we are a place marker and we're pushing things forward, but when it happens, then we will just get, um, we'll be a, a subset of it, and that, then I think things will start uh, moving even, even better than they are now. Great. Can I throw something in? Yes, of course. So just a lot of these while Jonah's getting set up. I mean, you didn't ask parents about anything in your survey, but I will point out there's a $500 fee to take the bus, which Probably Which is the highest, Jane? that's one of the yeah. highest. Do you have slides yeah. you want to present? I don't have any you slides. Okay. Seven, okay. 17, so we don't have to 16 okay. or 17 out of the 20 surrounding towns are at $300 or less. Right. I, I didn't because I wanted to ask the students why they didn't. And then if you start asking the parents as well, and it just gets too complicated with how many students do you have, and then what if they're asking for a student who also answered it over here? Um, I totally agree. I it's, criticism of the survey. No, no, no. But I'm, no, sorry. I'm, 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 just being, I'm just being naturally defensive. It's just a fact that it wouldn't come out in there. And I will say yes. anecdotally, yes. I know two or three families that don't use the bus because it's, of the It is, yeah. OK, yeah. so Jonah. Um, Jonah is a high school student. Uh, you're a chef. Sure. So I'm a high school student. I'm here. Momentarily, I'm a senior, so class of 2019, um, and here to kind of supplement a little bit of the transportation discussion to give you a little bit of an idea from a student's perspective, um, just a little bit more about me. Um, I have been part of Student Congress for four years and am kind of representing that arm of the school. Um, student Congress got involved in transportation and really interested in transportation um, when probably every meeting we had a new person come in and say you need to do something about parking you need to do something about parking you need to do something about parking uh, because from the student perspective um, it is and I'm going to use some general generalizations about students in general of course there are huge ranges um, for everybody. But um, from a student perspective, uh, many, about 225, according to a survey we did last year, if not more, are using um, their own vehicle to get to school. Um, but there are only about 150 uh, spots within wa um, short walking distance, about five minute walk of the school to park in. So you're having about 75 to 100 students park um, every day in God knows where. Um, maybe it's um, illegal parking spots, maybe it's unsafe parking spots, um, friends, neighbors' houses. Um, but we have a large gap in the number of students that are driving to school um, that have the means to and want to, um, and a gap in the uh, number of spots we have. And I could go on and on about why is that. Um, but for this group, um, as Quentin and Alan point out, there's a, there's a real large opportunity to not, when Student Congress attacks the problem, we very much looked at it from how, what areas can we go to make more parking spots. Um, but I think for this group, it can also be how do we reduce the number of students looking for parking spots. And I think there's an opportunity for really tangible change to reduce emissions and um, also, as Ellen was saying, it's a social problem. Um, for the students who don't necessarily have the means to drive to school, there aren't a lot of, um, there aren't a lot of systems set up for those students. Um, there's not a lot of systems set up to co help coordinate inter between students. Um, so just to specifically address a couple of questions that I've been hearing, um, the first one, um, if we can park more easily. So that is about um, students are getting to school about 40 minutes to an hour early to secure a parking spot. 
Um, and so for me, specifically, that would mean the um, ninth grader down the street would much rather go with his parents to school because I have to get there 40 minutes early because I'm then going to <coughs> practice, etc. And he doesn't want to carpool with me because that includes getting up 40 minutes earlier. Um, so I think that parking more easily, um, that's kind of the issue right there. Mm -hmm. Which can, miles to share, there's a bunch of other options. Um, if I felt more comfortable on the bus, so that was one, um, the loser cruiser comment. Um, I've actually never heard that. I think a lot of students have, um, and a lot of families make the conscious decision um, that paying the money for a potentially second or third car is going to be worth it. Um, and a lot of families in Wellesley have the ability to make that choice. And so why then, oh, of course I would never take the bus if I can just drive my own school car to school. Um, but what if the bus actually makes it easier on the student is a question. Uh, many, you have, I think the numbers above 50, 60% of students participating in sports each year. Well, what if that bus makes it really easy on the student and gets you to spray fields and what's going to be this uh, sports complex? Um, so that's one question. I don't think there's necessarily a stigma against the bus, but I think um, it's impractical for a lot of students. Um, <coughs> if I felt safe leaving my bike, that was one comment I don't understand at all. Um, my brother bikes to school um, often during the fall and spring, and so I never heard about bike. Um, I don't know where that comment was coming from. I, sometimes the answer is I don't know. <laughs> and then um, the last thing about opportunities for this committee um, and group. Uh, Miles to Share was definitely a program that the students was interested in. That's essentially what would be an Uber um, that would coordinate ride sharing between students. Um, and so it's instead of a public group, um, the people who can participate in Miles to Share are only students at that school, probably with only the student login. Um, so it's a safe program and also definitely um, a piece that could chip away um, suddenly. And just to wrap up a little bit, if anybody has any questions, I can absolutely help to answer those from a student's perspective, from the student community's perspective. But there are there are so many complexities of this issue as there are every issue. Um, start times, um, students traveling to school, parents being able to carpool to school, students come from their house but they don't necessarily leave school to go to their house, they leave school to go to activities, etc. Um, but I, having worked on this for a couple months now, um, and Bridget, our student Congress president, would definitely agree with this, um, there is a large opportunity to start chipping away at um, admission standards, at helping parents, at helping students understand um, their responsibility in a sustainable community. Um, and I think I would very much encourage this conversation to continue happening um, and to continue to look at ways to change the student transportation. Perfect. And what I'm going to, that is, thank you, Gemma. And um, a perfect segue to, yes, this conversation will continue right here, right now, uh, when we get to the breakouts. So I'm going to ask that we take any questions, there are a few hands going up already, uh, and take them to the breakout, uh, and we'll work on it more there. Because uh, there are a couple of other things I want to get to, uh, which will also be breakouts. Um, and I was going to go in this order if it's okay. Um, Sue is going to talk about waste reduction and then Regina about pesticides. So can we do that? Okay, thank you. I will be brief. Um, anyway, another problem we've been chipping away at for a long time. Um, we started out, I'm, I'm Sue Morris with Wellesley Green Schools. I work closely with Phyllis. And 
a few others. Um, anyway, so the, uh, we started out with basically looking at all the events that, that all the different schools are doing and trying to figure out how to reduce waste. So then we came out with the Smart Event Guide, which I can, I can pass some of this around. I think it's helpful to just look at what we're talking about. Anyway, it's sustainable materials and reduced trash. And you know, we basically just took this to all the PTOs and said, whenever you're doing events, can you just be mindful of you know trying to keep you know not sending out paper invitations if you're doing your auctions? Can you think about using you know um, various you know don't use plastics and so forth? And then we took it to the next step, and we had the PTOs at the middle school and the high school, um, or actually we bought the first set um, of water dispensers, basically because I do also hospitality at the high school. And, you know, back to school night, they would cart in 10 cases of water bottles. And then, you know, I would do the teacher's events when I was taking it over. And same thing, they're carting in, you know, all kinds of water bottles for this. And I'm thinking, this is so incredibly <laughs> wasteful. And honestly, like my pet peeve is a water bottle. I cannot stand what's happened in, in this world, how water bottles went crazy. I mean, again, growing up, I always say, there was one option, and it was Evian, and it you know, was so darn expensive that no one used them, and no one needed to, because there were water fountains at fields, and you just didn't think of buying water bottles, and then they became very cheap, and then they just, everything went crazy. So, long story short, we started with the you know, high school events, and we did away with all the water bottles. We used these water dispensers. Everyone thought it was great. So then that was just for teachers' events. Then we took it to the sports banquets. Everyone thought it was great. Then we had the high school PTO buy a couple. We had the middle school PTO buy a couple. They were getting so much use, we ended up buying two more. So each school now has four, or not each school, middle school has four, high school has four, and then I have four that I lend to you know, whatever events ask for them. So, um, and then we took that one step further, and for these, all these sports banquets and school um, you know, dances and so forth, we um, were able to get some money from Needham Bank to buy tablecloths. And again, I can, I can show you guys some of this, but um, that has been great because we were able to um, you know, cut down on more waste. Every single season, every sports team has a banquet. So, and they were all buying the plastic, you know, Raiders colors, black and red. So we bought um, as many as we could with our $300 grant. Um, and we started marketing it to people, and lo and behold, everyone loved the idea. It was saving them money. It was kind of like win-win. Save money. You know, we make it very user-friendly. We drop them off. We'll wash them if people can't wash them, whatever. Um, and then have them ready, because during banquet season, there's a banquet every night. So we just have them ready for the people for the next banquet. And again, that was wildly successful. Everyone loved it. And then, so every season, instead of us marketing to people, I get frantic you know, emails like, can we use the tablecloths and, and the water dispensers and so forth. So that's been great. So then just one other thing that we've been working on, or one of many things that we've been working on, but um, just something that came up right now was starting with the, um, you know, the prom season. So it was last year, I was at a cotillion party and you know, there was like 200 or so kids at the party and every single person, you know, boy and girl had a corsage and, and um, boutonniere, pl uh, plastic clamshell container. Um, and, you know, they basically end up as like a sea of waste at these, at these prom parties or cotillion parties. So anyway, we had a discussion and thought, gee, there has to be a better alternative to this. As now we all know, you know, the huge issues with the recycling, that the first order of business has to be reduced. So we approached um, basically Winston's, Roach Brothers, and um, Whole Foods to see, they're the main suppliers of all the corsages and boutonnieres, to see if they would be willing to consider alternatives. And Winston said no, for various reasons. But um, you know, Karen Franzik, who Lisa had put me in touch with at Whole Foods, was very receptive. She was like, you know, this is a great idea. We don't sometimes think about things until people, you know, presented as an issue. They're working on it. Whole Foods would be huge because they're obviously a national, you know, food chain and would be, you know, that would be a huge amount of waste uh, reduced. But then uh, Roach Brothers also was very open to the idea and was actually the first to say, okay, you know, we made the change, we're doing this. So anyway, it's just, again, small steps, chipping away, we're, you know, just trying to be as mindful as we can of different ways that we can have control to reduce waste at school and around town. 
Awesome. Okay, and then just one thing. This is the container we sort of proposed to them instead of the plastic clamshell. It does have a window, which I asked Jeff is on the ground. It, that's not a deal breaker for these to be recycled. But anyway, it's, this is a just much more environmentally friendly container than you know the plastic clamshell that they were using. So when we break out, you could use some help in pushing some of these projects forwards in yes. to build so, on your fabulous success. Yes, and so my next target is these pla uh, black plastic containers that all the restaurants and, um, and in fact, Wells Country Club drives me crazy. Um, black plastic is a huge problem um, for various reasons. It's it's a very it's a scrap plastic, low grade. It's not there's no you know uh, there's a reuse for it. Everyone can reuse them in their own home, but they're not very recyclable. And in fact, the black plastic contaminates other recycling. Mm -hmm. So that, this is what a lot of the restaurants are using because yeah. it preserves the food, and, you know. Okay. Yes. What are they using it for? So uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my next big target. Okay. Um, and I know this issue is in a lot of different. Thank you, Sue. Do you guys want to stand up and mention anything about this or no? Oh. Put you on the spot. Oh, well, we're 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 come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Well, I'm Bonnie Kapoor, and this is my sister Aisha. And we started a program called the Project Plastic, and we're hoping to reduce plastic in, well, like, eventually, like, nationwide. But we're starting in Wellesley, and we are picking up plastic from the streets. What do you think say? Um, yesterday we went from, I think, Cliff Road to a little bit of Route 9, and we picked up, how many bags? Um, at least like 17 bags of plastic oh. and trash. Oh. <laughs> like 17 people there, and there was like a bag per person, and we didn't even travel like a half mile. And that, oh all of God. that trash came out of like wow. a half mile on the sidewalk of Fruit Nine. And it was oh, like a west down side. Uh, yes. And it was just like a little strip of the sidewalk. We couldn't even make it all the way to the middle school from Cliff Road because oh. there was so much trash, plastic and trash there. Like oh. it was an insane amount. And oh. like there was no way to pick it all up. Yeah. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, Regina, yeah, well, if you want to wrap us up. Group, but I'm Regina LaRock, I've seen many of you. Um, also the chair of the Natural Resources Commission. And I'll just highlight the Healthy Yard Program. Have you guys seen the signs around town? Raise your hands if you have. Somebody put one in the yard. Okay. So we have a, a, a campaign going to encourage people to not apply pesticides and herbicides to their lawns and to be proud of it. And so you'll see the green signs around. If anybody doesn't have one and would like to host one, let me know and we'll get one for your yard. And I, we're also making a video, which Wellesley Media is going to be finishing up in the next couple weeks. And it would be great to help disseminate that. And then lastly, I'll just point out there's some legislation coming up um, in the state legislature, which we all should be paying attention to. And I don't know the numbers offhand, but there is, a bill um, to propose uh, banning the pesticide preemption law, which prohibits municipalities from banning pesticides in a more strong way than the state does. So essentially towns can't do anything to prevent pesticide use on non-municipal lands. This law would prevent, would change that. There also is a proposed- What's it called? Yeah. It's called the pesticide preemption override. If you just okay. search- It's a little confusing. Um, Could you just explain it one more? So, um, there is a law in many states called the pesticide preemption, which has been promoted by the chemical industries for the most part, that forbids municipalities from preventing the use of pesticides on private lands. Mm -hmm. It's in place in many states across the country. This would prevent that in Massachusetts and hence would allow towns to pass their own bylaws controlling pesticide use. We already do not apply pesticides on town-owned land. This would allow us to potentially think about making um, requirements of private land as well. The reason this is important, obviously, is because there's a wide and increasing body of literature that shows that these chemicals have health impacts on humans and animals and 
Um, so that is pending in the state legislature, and I would encourage you, if you go to the website of the state legislature and search pesticide, you'll find the bill numbers. You can call our state reps and ask them to support it. I think Cynthia Cream already does, Becca Rausch. And the second law, that is a bill that is being proposed, is a glyphosate ban in the state of Massachusetts. So glyphosate is Roundup, and you probably have heard about the recent lawsuits um, against Monsanto. Um, deeming it was responsible for lymphoma in a few cases. And so there's a lot of attention about the health risks of glyphosate. So another thing you might want to do is look into supporting that legislation in Massachusetts. I, yes. I think um, in Quebec, I have a place up in Quebec, and you cannot buy Roundup in Quebec. Correct. It's I don't know about the rest of Canada, yeah. but in that's, Europe. Been, yeah. that's been in place for years. Right. That's but what I, inspired the pesticide companies to, to pass these pesticide reaction laws here in the States. Glyphosate is the most commonly used pesticide in the United States. Oh. So, so it's, you know, I've, probably everybody here has heard of Roundup. And oh, you see yeah. the ads on television with the little wilting oh, yeah. wilting dandelion. And, oh, yeah. So it would be huge if yeah. it passed. So, yeah, Regina, are you, are you asking for help? I don't know if I really, well, like, one thing we talked about, so um, yeah. Trish and the three of us were oh, on a call okay. with a couple others, Trish? Trish. <laughs> um, and Trish wrote an email to her neighbors, there's like a neighborhood email list, and so if you have one of those for your community and you want to draft something yourself, that's great, and say, hey, you know, tis the season to be working on our lawns, but have you thought about not putting down pesticides and other options? And she wrote one which we can share, and you're welcome to use it. Also, last year, our um, Sustainable Wellesley intern came up with a list of um, local landscapers that don't use pesticides or have the option not to, which mm -hmm. I'll share around if you want. Definitely double check with them because it's been a bit, but um, that would be one ask of our pesticide group. I have a thought about the landscapers. My landscaper has an alternative, and he's not listed. Oh, then let but me know. The idea of approaching landscapers might be. Well, that could be part of the working group. How do we do that? Um, I also okay. think so, I'm a student landscaper. I would be, I would yeah. surprise mine yeah. They yeah. all have access to it. So, I, that's it for this part. Um, we're now going to get into the action part. Um, we had more content than we normally have, uh, but I think it was all very good and very um, valuable and good stuff to, to know. Um, so, uh, we're going to break into just two different groups, those that want to work on um, waste and particularly black plastic with Sue, um, and then those that want to look at transportation um, with me, Jonah, um, uh, and then we will uh, think about, and Ellen, um, next steps uh, and ways to push this forwards collectively and individually. Can you give a shout out about the parade in the world? You know, the parade? Yeah, uh, just a reminder that uh, Sunday, May 19th, is Veterans Day Parade. And I think it's been four or five years, five or six years, that Sustainable Wellesley members have been marching to raise visibility about what we do. And last year, we had a fabulous float, thanks to Scott Bender, yeah. uh, to promote uh, not using pesticides in New York. Uh, and he had a festival. It. So it was really, it was quite nice. It was a great attention-getting thing, and we actually won a reward. So we're doing it again this year. If you're here in town and you'd like to participate, we'd love to have you. There's a sign-up sheet, um, and we would love to have kids riding on the float. So please sign up. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's just a short part of your day, and. Um, I'm not sure. I think the theme this year might be about Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. I have not know Scott. So, uh, but we're working on a theme. And uh, so please join us if you can. We'd love to have you. Great. Okay, so Sue, so maybe if you can find a... No, sorry, one more thing. Do you want to just tell people what the timing is on the breakouts? So we can take half an hour for breakouts. We'll have a snack, have some drink. Half an hour for the breakouts, and then usually 15 minute regroup and all the way up. Yep. Oh, wait, 1.30 okay. we're out here. Yeah. Okay, let's get it short. We promised you 1.30, so... So, bring it up. So, what's the time now? It's quarter after almost. Okay, so... Really quick um, breakouts. Really quick breakouts. So, the, so, if we can focus in the breakouts on how can I help. So, I'm sure you've got information, you can tell the group. Don't want to hear it right now. <laughs> um, what I want to know is how you can help. 
Um, so um, go to the go to the group and say contribute first with what you can what you can bring.